Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue on, on a study that we started in our last program on the prophet Amos, and on prophets in general. So we're glad you can join us once again, and I pray that it'll be a blessing for all of us as we go into God's Word, the words of eternal life. Which are always a blessing. Yeah, as I said, last week we did kind of an introduction to this, Mm -hmm. because this is a a new series for us. And if you haven't seen that, it would be worth your while to go spend a half an hour and watch that, so it'll set this up for you properly. But before we start tonight, I'm going to ask Mark, will you just ask God's blessing on our time together here? Well, Lord, it says where two or three of us Christians are gathered, you're in their midst also. And Lord, not only is our word here, but we would like your spirit here to guide us in what is said and what is done so we can proclaim your word more effectively to the people that need to hear it. Amen. 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 And I thank God we know that the spirit is here. That's right. Because I brought him. That's right. And I know she brought him. And it dwells you in this temple. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right, as I said, we're, we're looking now, at, and we're going to do a study for as long as it takes on the book of Amos. So if you'll turn to that in your Bibles, mm-hmm. and I pray you have your Bibles with you, okay? Because how can you do a Bible study with, without a Bible? Without a Bible. <laughs> and it would not do you any harm whatsoever to have something to write with and a, a notepad. To, to take little notes so you if something strikes your fancy which is also known as the prodding of the holy mm-hmm. holy spirit you may want to make a, a note of that and have conversation with the lord about it later on which is a very very excellent thing to do because you not only have to hear the word it's good to meditate on the word mm-hmm. it is good to converse with the lord our god about the word so that you get to that place where it is your habit and your practice To hear the word, confess the word, and then do the word. All right, Amos 1, 1. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned in visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. He was among the sheep herders. Um, we're seeing and studying the ministry of a sheep herder. And yes, is that a ministry? Yes. Ask Moses because he did it for a while too. David. Well, no, the fact is whether you're a, a butcher, a baker, baker, a candlestick maker, maker whatever you do should be your, it is your ministry mm-hmm. if you know the Lord God. You know, it says in Colossians, Paul wrote in Colossians and said, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. That's right. So if you're doing it, for the Lord, it becomes your ministry. Mm-hmm. You're not you're not doing it. I pray that you're not doing it to survive. Right. You're not doing it to meet your needs, because then you're standing in the place of God. Right. Because God has promised through the Apostle Paul in Philippians that He will supply all of your needs through His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You are an ambassador for Christ. That is your purpose for being out there in the workplace is to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus. So whatever you're doing. You need to become come to that place where you truly see it as your ministry in life. So many think of it, uh, a, a job is a provision for their family. Yes. And, that, and that's, it's, it's, that's it, dangerous. It, it, it's poor thinking. <clears throat> or somebody has said it's stinking thinking. Mm. Because what happens is it doesn't line up with the Word of God. Mm-hmm. And it starts to pull you away from the truth of the Word. Right. All right, but I'm talking about Amos now. Right. When Amaziah, who was the priest of Bethel up in the north, accused Amos of being a prophet, for, for a, a prophet for prophet, <laughs> mm-hmm. a professional minister making a living at, at it, just like he was, all right? Mm-hmm. It says in chapter 7, 14, verse 14 of this book, the book of Amos, it says, Then Amos replied to Amaziah, I am not a prophet, right. nor am I the son of a prophet. For I am a herdsman and a grower of sycamore figs. Amos 7, 14. Mm-hmm. Now the Hebrew word that's translated here as herdsman 
uh, that I just quoted in Amos seven fourteen is a bit different than the Hebrew word used here in verse one of the first chapter. Okay, in in chapter seven fourteen, it derives from the Hebrew word that's used in Ezekiel, and is translated as seek out. In Ezekiel thirty four twelve, it says, "As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered." So will I out, seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Now, you know that's important? Let me, let me say, say this. Now. this is, I'm, I'm going to ask you to pray about this in the test because I, I'm, I'm not on shaky ground here, but it's hard to prove this. Mm-hmm. There is a difference between a shepherd and a sheep herder. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I agree with that. A shepherd typically leads his flock from the front. Mm-hmm. You ever see he's got the staff out there and he's got his dog with him, right? Mm-hmm. And he leads his, and his, his sheep know him and follow him, mm-hmm. which is the way we're supposed to be with our good shepherd, with Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. right? The sheep herder, rather than being out front there, would typically be behind going after the scattered herd or flock, the strays, seeking to bring back stray or stragglers Mm. back into the fold. Mm. Okay? Okay. So I I, I think that's really a very valid uh, definition of the difference between the two. And it's one of the reasons, you know, it's important. Words are always important. That Amos doesn't call himself a shepherd, he calls himself a sheep herder. Right, right. That's a, that's a good point. Well, because the, the, the ministry of a prophet, although it may not seem evident either historically or in today's church, and I, I mentioned this in the uh, our introduction last week, in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 14, this is that which was written by Jeremiah, he says, your prophets have seen for you false and foolish visions, and they have not exposed your iniquity so as to restore you from captivity. But they have seen for you false and misleading oracles. And then in the, letter, in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet, in the fifth chapter, the 12th, 12th and 13 verses, he says, they have lied about the Lord and said, not he, misfortune will not come on us, and we will not see sword of famine. The prophets are as wind, and the word is not in them. Thus it will be done to them. Well, I I can't tell you how often I run across these prophets who are always saying, oh, no, misfortune can't come near you. Doesn't line up with the word. Well, that's because the word of God is not in them. Right. Is what Jeremiah is saying, okay? Mm-hmm. This is the way that it was in Israel at that time. Prophets who profited on the flock would not dare say things that might scare or offend their audience right. and chase them away. Right, right. And if you don't think that's true today, my friend, you're not paying attention, okay? In our day, well, let me read you something for that is... Paul's prophecy of our day Mm -hmm. from 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 and 4 he said for the time will come when they and he's talking about Christians will not endure sound doctrine but wanting to have their ears tickled they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths so we, that's why we are commanded. And this is not a suggestion. It's not an encouragement. This is a command of God spoken through the Apostle John. Okay? And he said in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. How do you test? Well, and by the way, I, you know, I, if you've watched or been with us at all, you know that I say over and over and over, don't trust me, test, test me. Test what I say. 
And it's not because I'm being humble. It's not because I, it is because that is the command of God. If you're listening to your favorite preachers and teachers and have not tested them, you are disobeying the word of God. It is quite that simple. So how do you test them? Well, it says in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. Okay? You have to speak according to the word. You know, a number of years ago, Alice and I were out, were out visiting and ministering in uh, the Dallas, Texas area. And I had occasion that uh, we knew somebody that was going to a very large church there. And they asked if we would go to church with them on, to their services on one Sunday. And we did. And it was one of these, it was large enough that the pastor, they did two services in the morning, one following right after the other. And the pastor got up and made a point of the fact that he had actually heard from God. Well, that's, he, what he well, he, that's what he said. But he had, so he had written the sermon himself, as opposed to maybe purchasing it on the internet. Right. And he got up and he spoke for the required twenty minutes. And at the end of the sermon, he was saying things I, I, I found it difficult to believe because he was saying some things that were absolutely contrary mm -hmm. to Scripture. Not just that they didn't line up with Scripture, but they actually contradicted the words of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the sermon, this is a large church with lots and lots of people in it. At the end of the sermon, and remember, I, I'm just visiting here. I never met this guy. I don't know him from anybody. I got up and I walked over to him. And I said to him, do you realize that the word of God says, and I quoted a scripture that was actually and absolutely the opposite of what he had just taught. And he looked at me and he said, well, I'm glad somebody still has a zeal for the word. Talked, turned around and walked away from me. <laughs> Now, the thing is, that should have astonished me. It didn't. And it is so unfortunate that it didn't. Mm. I mean, it just didn't shock me. It's a horror, but it didn't shock me. So think about what Paul wrote in Romans. I'm going to read Romans 16, starting at verse 17, 17 and 18. Now, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to to the teaching which you have learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. The only thing I can say is don't be unsuspecting. Mm. Test, examine, hold fast to that which is good. You are required by the Spirit of God to do exactly that. Okay, so Amos, he says, says goes on in the first verse to say he's from Tekoa. Now, I, I had mentioned last week that Tekoa is south of Bethlehem. It's about, I think it's, it's about probably about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. So it's south of Jerusalem, just south of Bethlehem. All right? Now remember that the nation, we're talking about Israel in the time of David when God had unified and brought the land all together under David. And then Solomon, and Solomon builds the temple in Jerusalem that is the focal point of all religious focus in, throughout the entire nation of Israel, right? Mm -hmm. right? But when Solomon died, okay, Rehoboam, his son, had a rebellion going on with Jeroboam. And the nation split into two parts. The north, Jeroboam, the king of the, in the, in the north, was with ten, the ten tribes. And then uh, Rehoboam, the king of the south, right? So the ten tribes of the north, they were bigger and more prosperous than the kingdom of the south of Judah. In the time of Amos. Substantially bigger, more people, more, more much more prosperous, right? And perhaps... More importantly to this study, it was the home, the north was the home of the school of the prophets, the professional prophets. The north is where Jerusalem is. Also. No, no, no. Okay. Oh, okay. Jerusalem so, is in the south. Okay. Okay. Jerusalem is in the south. Now, this is really important that you, that you get that because Jerusalem is still where the temple is and where God has caused his name to dwell in the temple. 
right, in the Holy of Holies, right? So I want to, I want to take a, a moment to talk about the school of the prophets because we're talking about prophets. And this our understanding of prophets and prophecy really needs to get focused because I believe, and this is why I started to study, mm-hmm. that we are coming to a time when God's focus will be for sure. Not so much on the, it's going to be on prophecy. Yes. Calling those sheep scattered back into a right relationship with him. All right? mm-hmm. Exposing their iniquity yes. so that they can be restored. It says that Elijah, in, in the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, it talks about how Elijah will come before the great and terrible day of the Lord, mm-hmm. before the coming of Jesus Christ a second time. Right. God sent John the Baptist, the prophet John the Baptist, to make ready the people for the coming of the Lord the first time, right? Mm -hmm. God is going to send prophets to prepare his people for the coming of Jesus Christ. So I I want to read this from 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm going to start at verse 38. And I'm going to read a little bit of it, so you might want to turn to that. And if you don't read, turn to it now, please make a note of it and read it later. What were the verses? 2 Kings 4, starting at verse 38. When Elisha returned to Gilgal, there was a famine in the land. As the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, Put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Then one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it his lap full of wild gourds and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, for they did not know what they were. So they poured it out for the men to eat. And as they were eating of the stew, they cried out and said, O man of God, there is death in the pot. And they were unable to eat. But he said, Now bring meal. He threw it into the pot and said, Pour it out for the people that they may eat. There was no harm in the pot. Now a man came from Baal Shashli, Shalah, and brought the man of God bread and the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in his sack. And he said, give them to the people that they may eat. His attendant said, what will I set before a hundred men? But he said, give them to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. So he set it before them and they ate and had some left over, according to the word of God. Now, this is the time, by the way, of in Elijah, the prophet Elisha, Elisha, right? We're naming the leper, right? You know the account of Naaman the leper. Mm-hmm. So Naaman is, he hears that there's a prophet. Well, actually, let me just read Second right? Kings 5, 8. It happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. He sent word to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Talking about Naaman. The king was desperate because Naaman, who was a a prized man of his, had this leprosy. So what is Elisha's response? Send him to me, that he would know that there is what did I say? There is a prophet in Israel. So you say that again more clearly. There is right. a prophet in a Israel. A prophet? There is a prophet in Israel. This is the home of the school sons, of the prophets. The sons of the prophets, yeah. There's all kinds of prophets. I just find that interesting. There is that, a, there is a prophet. prophet. In the midst of the famine, these prophets were eating miraculously, and their numbers were growing. All right, like remember Jesus feeding the five thousand. Exactly. Well, that's what I was going to say. In, in John six twenty six, the crowds followed Jesus to Capernaum, and Jesus answered and said to them, "Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled." Mm. It appears likely that the Lord sent a prophet to, to Tekoa, from Tekoa, to speak in the north because of the corruption of the professional prophets in that land. Right, right. Hmm. I mean, they they had the schools of the prophets up there. 
But he sent somebody from down south, south of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, to go prophesy. And I believe it's because he couldn't find a prophet. prophet. Elijah's gone by this time. Yeah. He couldn't find a prophet who was speaking his word. Now he says that he's going to, it's, he's going to prophesy. He's going to speak the things which he saw concerning Israel. Right? God showed him a vision. And it was about Israel in the days of King Uzziah in the south, in Judah. Right? Mm -hmm. Remember Isaiah's vision? Isaiah chapter 6, in the days of Uzziah, no, I he was in a temple. He saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the, the temple. temple. Oh, that's right. So it's the days of uh, King Uzziah and Jeroboam, the son of Joash, in the north, in Israel, where the Lord sent Amos. Yeah. So in the north, Joash is the king. I'm not, not, I'm sorry, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, is the king, all right? So now I want to read to you from 2 Kings chapter 14, starting at verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned for 41 years. All right? So this, we got this now? Okay. Jeroboam, and this is not the first Jeroboam that, that, that divided. This is Jeroboam number two here. In verse 24, it says, he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel sin. So the king there is doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Okay? Now, just, just remember that as we go along. And then in the, there at the end of that first verse, he, he mentions two years before the earthquake. So... He, is, he starts prophesying two years before the earthquake. It's interesting that they mention that. They even mention the earthquake there. And it Alice says happened. it's interesting. <laughs> well, it hadn't happened yet, but remember, at the time it's being written now, it is history to them, right, okay? Right, right. And earthquakes can be memorable moments. Yes. And it's locked in time. It is, but they, they, they tend to be memorable moments. So yes. it's locked in time in the minds of people. Right. So they can, when, if That's I talk to you, back, and I don't remember. 9-11. Uh, if, if I mention yeah. the, the San Francisco earthquake, yeah. does that no. mean anything to you? No. Just, Not really. Just what we've read. Well, you're thinking about 1906, I take it. Yeah. How about 1989? Oh, right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have a time frame and a location? Well, but those are the two. If you talk to people in California. Now, 1906, the great earthquake right. in San Francisco, which yeah. basically destroyed the whole city, you know, that's kind of ancient history. 1989 is not ancient history. No, no. I mean, I remember that very well yeah. because it was, it was seen live on television right. because it happened during the time that the World Series was taking place that's there right. in San Francisco. Right. Right. Yeah. So there were news reporters and everything all over the place when this earthquake happened. Yeah. And it was massive, massive earthquake. Uh, Alice and I, you know, we were living in California in 1994 when there was the North Ridge earthquake, mm. which was also, I think it did $40 billion worth of damage just just north of Los Angeles. It, it's interesting it's because, like, the, yeah, was, two days after the earthquake, I had to go. We were living in California up in the Bay Area, and I had to go down to L.A. So, I mean, I saw all of this massive destruction and had to take take a circuitous route yeah, to get around because the, the major highways had been destroyed in areas, mm -hmm. right? So the point is that people mark their history by such so major earth-shaking events. <laughs> God-shaking. Well, you know, we use that expression. These are well, earth-shaking events. Quite literally. Yeah. Yes, yeah. this was quite literally. literally. Yeah. But Alice says, now, why is it mentioned? And I believe, because I'm saying to you, that this prophecy, the, the book of Amos, we're studying it to set up for the preparation of the coming of the Lord. Well, how does this tie into the coming of the Lord? There's only one other place in Scripture where that earthquake is specifically mentioned. And that's in the prophet Zechariah later on. And in Zechariah 14, verse 5, it says, You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee 
just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. The reference is there will be an earthquake before. that will be more than memorable just before the coming of the Lord. Okay? That's a link here to the last days. Mm, that's interesting. Okay. Well, in, let's move on to verse 2. In verse 2 he said, The Lord roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice. And the shepherds pasture grounds, pasture grounds mourn, and the summit of Carmel dries up. Now you know Carmel? Carmel is up by today, by, uh, what is it, Haifa? The port city? Yeah, up in the north, okay. The Lord roars from Zion. Well, let me let me read that the way it says in Hebrew better. I mean, I'm going to say it in Hebrew. But Yahweh roars from Zion, and from Jerusalem he utters his voice. Now, Peter wrote that the devil goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. But our God is a roaring lion. Yes. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Wisdom stands in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. Proverbs 120. So God roars from Zion. Wisdom stands in the street and shouts. In John 737, Jesus said, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Let's stop for a moment and have a rousing chorus of it is no secret. What God can do. It is no secret what God can do. God is not a God of hiding things. No. He is a God of revelation. Yes, he reveals. Isn't it? It, just let me give you a couple of verses. In Psalm 103, verse 7, it said, He made known his way to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. Mm -hmm. In Isaiah 46, 10, he said, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish my good pleasure. In Ephesians 1.9, Paul wrote, He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. Right to the last book, the book of Revelation, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants. Mm -hmm. Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. But in his letters in that last book, to each of the churches, the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He says at the end of each letter, but he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Mm. Those who are not his bondservants are likely not listening, yeah, yeah. at least to him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? They're busy listening to the false prophets, pastors and teachers who are loudly proclaiming the things that they desire rather than the things that God desires just as the Apostle Paul prophesied that we talked about. So we're going to come back and talk about this more because this is so very, very important. But before I go, and Alice and Mark, we just want to thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. That you are a God of revelation, that you are there to show us, to lead us in paths of righteousness, that you have the words of eternal life. And Lord, you're not hiding them from us. You're revealing them to us. Lord, our desire is to find your good pleasure in our lives and not seek our own pleasure. That we might be like your son and say, not my will, but thy will be done in Jesus' name. Well, until next time, may the Lord bless you and may he use you for the glory of his name. Amen. So I'll cherish not all. Yes.